Hello, hello, and welcome everyone. I just hit the live button. I'm looking at YouTube to make sure it is going live and I'm seeing some likes come in. So I'm assuming that means that uh, we have people here and we have people coming on. Awesome. I'm gonna sh close the YouTube window because otherwise I hear the YouTube window and I don't need to hear myself. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello, OT practitioners and friends to our special OT Occupational Therapy Month Professional Development Course. And thank you so much for joining us today. And if you're watching the replay, thank you for tuning in at a time that works for you. If you are here, feel free to use the chat. Um, I'm gonna be in there once Bev gets going and we have Chandler in the chat as well to help anyone out with our needs today. So for those of you who might not know who I am, my name is Jason Davies and I am an occupational therapist based in Southern California. Over at the OT Schoolhouse, I've, de I've basically dedicated my working life to school-based occupational therapy by creating tools and sharing knowledge to support OT practitioners in schools all over, um, all over the world even. It's amazing. We probably have people here today from Australia, the UK, all over. So thank you so much for being here. As we get going, I do want to remind you all that if you would like to receive a certificate of completion for this course and get access to the slides, as well as so much other um, great school-based OT resources, you can join the OT Schoolhouse Collaborative over at otschoolhouse.com slash collab or by using the link in the description below. This OT Month course is presented by uh, what I was just talking about, the OT Schoolhouse Collaborative, where you can be part of a dedicated school-based OT practitioner community and get access to unlimited courses, resources, mentorship, and even more to thrive in your school-based OT role. Every month we host a professional development course just like this one, and we would love to have you join us in the near future. All right, well, we are going to dive into our present presentation today on how to win over teachers and kids with proven fun strategies to improve writing. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring on uh, Dr. Moskowitz right now and provide a brief intro. Hi, Dr. Moskowitz, we see you now. And we will be on our way. So, very quickly, our very special guest today is Dr. Beverly Moskowitz. You may know of her. Dr. Bev, as she often goes by, is a seasoned pediatric occupational therapist with a remarkable over 48 years of experience. As you will soon learn, she is the mastermind behind the Size Matters Handwriting Program, a revolutionary approach that has been globally recognized for its effectiveness in improving handwriting skills. As the founder of Real OT Solutions, Dr. Beverly is dedicated to providing therapists, teachers, parents, anyone who works with a child and the children themselves with practical and engaging solutions that are not only effective and efficient, but also affordable and fun. The school-based OTs, we love that affordable part and the fun part. So her passion for innovation and collaboration has solidified her reputation as a respected leader in the field. And we are thrilled to have Dr. Beverly as our esteemed guest um, speaker for the course, Win Over Teachers and Kids with Proven Fun Strategies to Improve Writing. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and hit the share screen button for Dr. Bev, and we are gonna get going. Dr. Bev, the floor is yours. Well, hi everybody. I wish I could see, I can't, I trust that you're there. Thank you so much, Jason, for inviting me to be a part of the OT Schoolhouse Collaborative. Uh, as Jason said, I am a seasoned OT, doing this for 48 years, and I'm the author of the Size Matters Handwriting Program. So I'm delighted to share this with you. Um, aside from the fact that I have created this program, I truly believe it's the future. I'm a very grounded therapist. You have to teach handwriting, but it's not about form. Letter size is that variable that will make the biggest difference in the consistency and therefore the readability of the page and we have the research to prove it. Now this, this short one hour course is not gonna go over the research, if you want to learn more about that, you can. I'm going to show you where you can find it on the website if you want to download it. If you want to learn about it from me personally, I'll share how you can do that too. Uh, but right now I'm going to uh, share with you that, yes, I am Beverly Moskowitz. Uh, and thank you again, uh, Jason, for inviting me to speak today. So here's our learning objectives for the next hour. Uh, at the end of the time, you're going to be able to identify two to three SMHP, and that's our shorthand for Size Matters Handwriting Program. 
concepts and strategies that can be embedded in all content areas across the curriculum. The research shows it's not about 250 minutes of practice in a workbook a week anyway. You have to have concepts and strategies that happen all day long in all content areas because writing does happen in social studies, science, in math, the kids are writing. So you want to remind kids about the best practices in handwriting so their writing is legible there too. You're going to be able to identify two to three SMHP concepts and strategies to build student buy-in and teacher carryover. And gosh, I can't emphasize that enough. It, it's, you know, people that say, I, I'm not a handwriting therapist, I'm not a handwriting teacher. I, I, I gotta say to you guys, first of all, get over it. We are, we are because we're about function. Uh, in school, uh, in school practice, we're about function, participation, and one of the skills that kids have to do in school is to write. And we, um, more than anybody else, can identify those concepts and strategies that are doable for teachers. Our job is not to give teachers more to do. They have plenty. But we want to give them strategies that they can embed handwriting across the curriculum, make it easier for them to do so, uh, build that buy-in with the kids so that there's follow through. So I'm going to give you a few suggestions uh, for both of those. So we're going to start with the key concepts. There's eight of them. In fact, I should share with you, this is a concept-driven approach. You can get started tomorrow with your knowledge alone. Now we have materials, they, they, they make it easier for you. They make it more consistent if you're using SMHP in a school setting, a classroom setting, but you can certainly get started with your knowledge alone and you can even make some of the stuff. And I'll share with you how you can do that uh, in your setting. These are the concepts, uh, writing lines, letter lines, super C, starting points, touch points, letter size, uh, stars and dice, spaghetti and meatballs. After that, we're going to talk about how to build student buy-in, teacher carryover. So the first concept is that of writing lines. I don't care if it is April. It is April, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't care what month it is that you introduce size matters to your school. We always make sure that we're on the same page, literally naming the writing lines. And I'll say to kids, uh, after I put these lines on the board, on your smart boards, Promethean boards, whatever you're using. So what do you guys call this line? And you'll hear things like uh, the grass line, the ground line, the foot line. There are programs that have a descender line uh, uh, below here. They call that the foot line. This became the knee line. Size Matters is a very plain and simple program. We call this line the bottom line. So I asked the kids if it would be okay if we just call the bottom line the bottom line. I asked them, what do you call this line? And you'll hear things like the hat line, the headline, the sky line. I mean, there's a zillion names for it. And I say to the kids, if it's okay with you guys, could we just call the top line the top line? And I'm cool with this either being the dotted or the middle line. It's important to establish a uniform terminology for the writing lines because touching the writing lines in all the right places determines whether or not you made your letters the right size. Now, along with that concept is that of go lines and finish lines. Go lines are green lines down the left side of the page, the paper, the desk. Finish lines are checkerboards down the right side of the page the paper, the desk. And we're talking about um, teaching uh, uh, the alphabet for, um, not for Semitic characters who go right to left, but for those of us who write left to right. I prefer a finish line to a red line because it implies dynamic movement. We're moving toward the finish line. So yes, movement toward the go line, it would be considered backward movement. Movement toward the finish line would be considered forward movement. And we talk about that in the directionality of making certain letter lines, the top of seven, the slant in R, the hump in H. Those letter lines are made in the direction of the finish line. They're considered forward moving letter lines. By contrast, the bottom of G, that little hook, 
that first diagonal in K, the diagonal in Z, those letter lines are made in the direction of the go line. They're considered backward moving letter lines. Go lines and finish lines are terrific visual references. If you have kids with reversals, if you have kids with dyslexia, uh, dysgraphia, they give, give the kids that directionality cueing that they need to make their letters uh, properly oriented. You could put go lines and finish lines on desks if you wanted to. Uh, use highlighter tape. For the green line, I caution against using floral tape. Learn that lesson the hard way. It will stain your sleeve. Uh, you can buy checkerboards from Amazon. You can make a checkerboard. Uh, get some masking tape and a Sharpie. Make a little checkerboard. That will help your kids remember the directionality of movement. Now, go lines and finish lines are cute for your younger kids. Not so cute for your older kids. Know that they eventually morph into your left and right margin lines. But don't expect that anybody knows what they are. Ask the kids, do you, do you know why that line is there? They're gonna be like, uh, no? Okay, so you wanna to say to them, that's because all of your writing has to begin next to your go line or your left margin line. And if you have more than three letters to write and you see that right margin line coming up, you're going to go to the next line. If you're making a list, you're going to make your numbers to the left or outside your left margin line. Okay, the next concept is that of letter lines. And this year is where we name them. We have standing tall letter lines, uh, lying down letter lines. We have slant ones. They go forward and backward. Clock lines that wrap around an analog clock from 12 to 6 or 6 to 12. Sure, hope you have some analog clocks in your classrooms. Frown lines that go forward and backward. And I would often do this exercise just to entertain myself because invariably, here's what you see. When you ask a child to find, can you find me a letter that, that has a standing tall line in it? The kids are going to look all over the place like it's going to jump out of thin air. Okay, that's how you know that they never noticed the alphabet strip above the board, the one that's on their desk. Basically, they think that's for filing their nails. Any of the posters that are in the room, it's, it's white noise. So you might wanna introduce your children to those awesome references your teachers have taken time to hang up. Uh, during handwriting instruction time, you can ask kids to identify different types of letter lines. If you have something like that in your school, and we'll talk about if you do or if you don't. Now, Super C is our superhero. He's a letter line, but he's so important, he's given his own status as a key concept. So there are five uppercase letters that are Super Cs, C, G, O, S, and Q. There are seven lowercase letters that are Super Cs, A, C, D, G, O, Q, S, and he comes packaged with a little extra drama. We always identify what letter size a, 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 a letter is. And then we say, but not only. And that means that it starts with the C formation. So how are you going to remind kids about what a C formation is so they don't make that backwards? Harken back to your go lines and finish lines. And, and think about what do superheroes do? Well, they save us, they protect us. So like any superhero, Super C is gonna go back to go first to make sure there's no stragglers, nobody left behind. Gather up all those stragglers before he continues on his way. That's the Super C backstory. But that may be the, the story, the visual, the, the, um, the kinetic motion that kids need to live to remember to always go back to go before they head forward when they're making super C letters. The next concept is that of starting points and initial lines. So um, uh, starting points are indicated by a green dot, a little directional arrow. Initial lines are the lines that emanate from the starting point. So in this little excerpt from the um, a therapist manual, you can see that all the letters start on a line. The initial line for uppercase A is a backward slant. 
for uppercase B, it's a standing tall. For super C, um, for C, imagine that it's a super C letter. It starts at the top line. In fact, all letters at the Size Matters Handwriting Program start on a line. Remember I said that. So let's talk about initial lines. Where does, what's the initial line for uppercase F? Give you a chance to think about it. Oh, you are correct. It is a standing tall. For uppercase V, it's a forward slant. How about Z? It's a forward lying down. G, it's a super C. Okay, now it's going to get a little bit tricky. How about lowercase f? Where does it start? What's its initial line? It's an exception. It starts below the top line. Its initial line is a backward frown. How about lowercase e? Oh, I hit the button too fast. It starts between the dotted and the bottom line. Its initial line is a forward line down. Listen, I don't even bring those letters up until I get to it. You got one of those letters in your name. You got to it. But I drill consistency of size. Size matters is not a font. This is a very simple letter creation. Everyone's going to stylize on their own. I don't know if you're writing the same way you learned when you were in kindergarten. I know that I'm not. Uh, I learned ball and stick kind of writing. Uh, everyone's going to stylize. You don't need to teach a stylized font. Um, if they eventually decide that they want to put a little monkey tail at the bottom of their T, that's okay. As long as they're touching the bottom line. How about number eight? Where does eight start and what's its initial line? Well, it starts at the top line and it's a super C. Number three starts at the top line and its, it's initial line is a clock line. Lowercase r starts at the dotted line. Its initial line is a standing tall. Okay, you can figure this part out. Uh, the next concept is that of touch points. And when I say touching, I don't mean getting really close. There cannot be any air between your pencil point and the writing line, and you can't be poking through the line either. It has to be a nice, clean intersection. Now, before we had a pandemic, I used to go up to kids and say, so am I touching you? How about now bring my finger closer and closer to their nose? Now, I touch my own nose. Am I touching? Am I touching? How about now? Because touching means touching. So we actually count how many times letter lines touch writing lines. C is easy. Touches at the top, it touches at the bottom, two touch points. Now, note that the red arrows indicate when letter lines touch writing lines. Blue arrows indicate when letter lines touch other letter lines. So B is a little bit trickier. You could say, and I hope you can see my cursor, touching, 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 and tell me it has five touches. I would be cool with that. Unless... Your child made that B and their first clock line started down here. You can see my cursor. You're going to say to those kids, so your clock line has to touch the top line. Now you're going to count that touch point. Or if they start their B and there's a gap, they started over here. Your clock line has to touch the standing tall line. This is a bit of a gray area. It's most important that you're consistent with yourself. That said, if your kids' letters are unrecognizable, it may well be because the touch points aren't there. So that's when you want to get fussy about making sure that all of the touch points are accounted for. Okay, but the biggie is the rule for letter size. So you've called these letters over time tall letters. Um, there's some programs they call them your giraffe letters. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that a seventh grader is not going to find that as cute as a kindergartner. Uh, we call them size one, size two, size three. That's what we call our different sizes. So the rule for size one letters is this. We, we like to say it's package is a song and a dance. I'm going to sing and dance for you all right now. Size one letters. They have to touch the top line. They have to touch the bottom line. They can't go higher. They can't go lower. They can't float in the middle. 
my friends, I did not tell you that it was a great song and dance. It's a sound bite. You're going to say a zillion times a day and touching means touching. So make your writing lines on the board. Make a pink rectangle. That's our color for size one. Make it exactly touch the top and bottom line. Teach the kids the rule. And then I make a perfect letter. I point out all the touches. Touching, 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 touching. If you make a letter like that, I'm going to give you a star. I wonder if I can do that again. Do you think I, you think I can? And then I can't. I make every single one at a time, errant looking A I've ever seen the kids make. And one at a time, I ask the kids to critique me. Is it star worthy? They go, no. You say, why not? I say, well, it's too tall. It's too long. This one is floating. This one's not touching over here. This is not touching on the, on the dotted line. Finally, touching, 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 touching. That's how you earn a star. All your uppercase letters are size one, and I don't care if you come to me in ninth grade. And know that the research shows that you can still make improvements in handwriting through ninth grade. And that said, I had a colleague share with me before and after results of a client who had a stroke. The change was remarkable after a few sessions, and that client was 92. So I don't know. I think you can make changes in handwriting way beyond ninth grade, but I don't care what grade you, you start. Always go back to the uppercase alphabet because the rule is the same for every single one. They have to touch the top line. They have to touch the bottom line. They can't go higher. They can't go lower. They can't float in the middle. Now, after you do your uppercase letters, your size one uppercase letters, uh, write words that are commonly found in uppercase letters. And a good source for that are signs. Look for signs in and around your building. It may say, it probably says exit in all capitals, principal's office may be in all capitals, cafeteria. Uh, look for signs in and around your neighborhood. Um, your school name may be above the, the front door on the lawn. Uh, use words that the kids will recognize. They practice writing them in all uppercase uh, letters, making each of those letters star worthy. After you do that, you move on to your size one lowercase letters. There are only seven of these. I do not teach B and D at the same time. I teach B as part of a BLT. And as before, make the lines on the board, make your pink rectangle, review the rule, make that perfect letter, point out all the touches, and then you say, you think I can do that again? Okay, the kids are starting to get wise to you. Because no, you can't. <laughs> yeah, listen, if there was more screen here, I could make 20 more errant looking Ds. And now you ask the kids, so uh, how did I do? And the kids go, terrible. You say, why? <laughs> it's too tall. This is too high. This is too low. This is floating. This is not touching. It's not touching here. Finally, touching in all the right places. Touching, 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 touching. Way to earn a star. But not only, and this is where in United Chorus, the kids should, should yell out, it's also a super C, meaning it starts with a C formation. After your size one lowercase, you're moving on to your size two. And here's the rule. They have to touch the dotted line. They have to touch the bottom line. They can't go higher. They can't go lower. They can't float in the middle. Gosh, I hope you weren't expecting more. It's a sound bite. You're going to say a zillion times a day. Now, there are 14 size uh, two letters. I do not consider the dot in lowercase i part of the body. It's the standing tall part that has to touch the dotted line in the bottom line. Yellow is our color for size two. Make your lines on the board. Uh, uh, scan some adapted writing paper onto your smart boards. Uh, yellow square indicates uh, a size two letter. And then you're going to make a perfect one. pointing out how it's touching in all the right places. And then the question, do you think I could do that again? And the kids go, no, you're terrible at this. <laughs> and you are, and you're intentionally making every single A you've ever, they all look like A's, right? Every single one of them looks like an A. And I would venture a guess that if you looked at your children's printing letter by letter, you could figure out what they were. It's in the context of the whole that it's a mess. That's how you know it's not about form. 
It has to be the consistency of size. So let the kids critique you. Finally, you're going to make one that's touching in all the right places. Way to earn a star, but not only. And I hope that you're all saying it's also a super C. Okay, here's the rule for size three letters. You need to be sitting down. Size three letters. Have to touch the dotted line. Have to go below the bottom line. Can't go higher, must go lower. And if it has a belly, it has to be sitting on the bottom line. Okay, I don't know if you were looking at the screen when I was doing this, but I was doing my little dance with my hands here. Um, there are five size three letters. Oh, I don't know why they're not populating. G, J, um, P, Q, and Y. It'll probably populate at the end of the slide. Blue is our color. For size three, make your rectangle so it starts at the dotted line and goes below the bottom line. Make a perfect G pointing out all the touches, touching, 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 going below. And then, do you think I could make another one? And then go, nope. And if, oh, there they are. Uh, there's the five size three letters. The only one without a belly is, is J. And now you're going to make everything you've ever seen the kids do. Okay. Again, they all look like G's, but are they star worthy? Let the kids critique you. You know, when you teach the kids the rules, it's as if you gave them the answers to the test. Now the kids can score you, they can score themselves. And best practice research shows that when kids have the ability to self monitor, you build the buy-in. You are giving the ability to self-monitor to them by teaching them the rules. They can score each other. Oh, now you can build pure mentors. Finally, touching in all the right places. Way to earn a star. But not only. It's also a super C. Okay, the next uh, concept well, you've heard me talk about way to earn a star. The next concept is stars and dice. Stars and dice, both a concept and a strategy, and that's going to lead to the kids feeling empowered, teachers being able to carry over these concepts throughout the school day and uh, being able to embed it across the curriculum. So um, I've used the word star worthy. Letter lines have to touch the writing lines in all the right places. At this point, we are scoring for size only. And in fact, this is a research study that I'm looking to launch. Anybody in a doctoral program, contemplating a doctoral program, looking for a research study, uh, please reach out to me. The whole bunch, we already have more research than any other program out there, and we're not done. So there's several studies in development. We have six published studies already, but I am already in talks with uh, several universities for more studies. And this is one of them. You know, all of the um, the handwriting assessments out there, uh, the THS, the test of handwriting skills is the only standardized one. The, the rest are normal criterion referenced. Relatively easy test to administer. It's a horrible test to score. You can be sitting there for 50 minutes trying to score it. So the other ones aren't, aren't much better. My contention is it really, it's about size. Stop, stop with your millimeter ruler. Who cares? If once you score for size, you get enough information that you can then have that child redo that same baseline writing sample, their name, upper and lowercase alphabet, a grade level sentence, score it for size after a period of intervention. You will see a marked difference and it will take you seconds to score clinical utility. That's important. So at this point, we're only scoring for size. Let's prove that. Let's, let's do a study and prove that we have a valid outcome measure using just size. Um, so for instance, suppose a child wrote three letters, AAA, ABC, DOG, and all of those letters were the right size. They got a score of three out of three. That's a, that's a perfect score. However, if their letters are not the right size, or maybe they made them the right size, but they made them the wrong way. So maybe instead of using two slant lines, and I'm hoping you're looking at me in the screen, um, if they're, instead of using two slant lines for an uppercase A, they're using one standing tall, one slant line for an uppercase A. You're gonna play the dice game, see if you can straighten it out. 
Suppose they started their letters at the bottom instead of starting them at, at the top, the top uh, line or the dotted line. They're going to play the dice game to, to work on uh, starting from the right place. And that said, my friends, oh, it's time to play the dice game. <laughs> the dice game determines practice. Whatever the kids roll is how many times they have to make a star worthy letter. If they roll a five, they have to make five star worthy letters. If they make five letters and only two are star worthy, they're still making you that letter. They're going to look at you cross-eyed. Really? And I often say to them, do I look like I'm kidding? <laughs> yeah. No, you have to make star worthy letters. And if they roll a one, imagine that they only have to make you one. So suppose they wrote the, the word Monday and it looked kind of like this. I'm going to give a star to O and D. Uh, overall, these letters are the right size. Uh, so there were six letters, two stars. If you need a percentage, there you go. I'm going to underline M, N, A, and Y. Those letters are not the right size. They are not touching the writing lines in all the right places. I'm going to play the dice game with each of those letters. I'm also going to underline D. While overall it's the right size, you'll notice there's a gap between the super C part and the standing tall. And I'm scoring for size, so they get a star. But now when I play the dice game, I want to fine tune it. I want to close that gap. I want to make sure that all parts of this M are touching the writing lines. Same thing with the Y. And that said, my friends, if your children, especially if they are in higher grades, and higher grades can be second, third grade on up. If they continue to make that uppercase A, okay, look at me. If they continue to make that uppercase A with a standing tall line and a slant line, but it's the right size, I'm going to tell you to move on. They just created their own font. And it's not about letter lines anyway. We teach them, but at a certain point in time, you need to move on because it really is not the most important thing. It's the consistency of size. Suppose the only way they don't reverse uppercase N is by starting at the bottom, going up, forward slant up i'm teaching starting at the bottom because it's not about starting points either so this is a very grounded approach here um we really don't it, it is the consistency of size we are not that concerned with letter lines we teach them but we have to be grounded practical realists it's consistency of size and if you think about it cursive starts at the bottom a lot of semitic characters start at the bottom we're, we're hung up on starting at the top that's not the most important thing. Okay, after that, we teach spacing. And we call that spaghetti and meatballs. That's our concept for teaching spacing. I strongly suggest that you not get hung up on space until you get 80% accuracy in size, and you will. And then we talk about inside space, in between letters, a little spaghetti, outside space, a big fat meatball. So at this point in time, I walk around with colored pencils. Uh, if it's a young child, I'm going to leave that point dull. If it's an older child, I'm going to sharpen that pencil. I use yellow for my spaghetti. And if there's still room, I'm still making spaghetti. Now I count all my potential spaghetti spaces, FYI. If you have a six letter word, you have five potential spaghetti spaces. If you have a three letter word, you have two potential spaghetti spaces. So you can count up all the letters in your words. You know, it was, it was, uh, all the spaces between your, uh, in your words, count how many of those issued single, uh, stars. And there's your data. That's pretty easy. Meatball spaces go outside of your words. So now I take my red colored pencil and I draw a little meatball in between all my words. If they didn't crowd the right margin, give them a free meatball. If they properly aligned on the left margin, give them a free meatball. Uh, but make all your meatballs the same size so they, the kids can see, well, they, this one was overlapping. Star those places where there was room for only uh, one meatball, not a meatloaf. And there's your data. Kids love this concept. And that said, they cannot score themselves for spaghetti and meatballs. 
unless they swap out their pencil for yellow and red ones because then it's unreadable all over again you know it's all lined up and you can't figure out what they wrote so make sure that they have that handy when you're ready to score for that any con any questions on the concept so far or you know what we can leave the write your questions down in the chat box let's let's catch up with them at the end of the presentation if that's okay that is perfect okay. bev go ahead yeah okay so let's talk about pushing into classrooms contextual collaboration working within the context of whatever subject the teachers are covering so uh suppose there is a handwriting instructional time good for you uh so you can ask the teachers uh can i come to your classroom well we already have a handwriting curriculum size matters can play in the sandbox with with any handwriting program in fact if your schools are embracing the uh, science of reading curriculum. We are the science of handwriting. Um, so there is a way to work together with those people or any other handwriting curriculum. Uh, no worries, just ask them what the letter of the day is. We're gonna come in and uh, maybe do a lesson on letter lines. So we can use the similar language. Can you find any letters with different types of letter lines? And then whatever the letter of the day is, make a perfect one. Now you're gonna teach the kids the rules. I'm sorry, I should have said that. Teach the kids the rules, make that perfect letter pointing at all the touches. And then, well, you know where this is going. You're gonna make a series of really bad ones because they all look like G's. Let the kids critique you. They love this part. Little kids love feeling like teachers and they love catching you when you mess up. You are intentionally messing up. They're so empowered by that. Let the kids tell you why it's not star worthy. You're gonna look crestfallen. During language arts, walk around with dice. For all those teachers that may say to you, may or may not say to you, listen, I believe in handwriting. I don't, I don't have any time in the day. Can you walk around with dice is what you're gonna to say to them. Because uh, when they're walking around, they can stop by somebody's desk, point to a, a letter or, or a word, something that you've covered already. The letters uh, uh, that you've covered, if all the letters in the word are, have, are ones that you've covered, the whole word, and then ask the kids, so how'd you do? Is it star worthy? And now the kids are gonna go, uh, no. And you say, well, why not? What, what, what size is uppercase A and, and what's the rule? So now you're singing and dancing with the kids. Um, Suggest they pick out a die that's calling their name. Listen, my dice game has 24 die in it. They're four-sided. They're six, eight, 10, 12, 20 faceted a die. I say to the kids, if you irritate me, I'm gonna give that to you on purpose. You're, you're gonna be there all day. Uh, they're sparkled, they're iridescent, marbleized. Some of them have the pips, the little dots. Some have numbers, some have sign language. Um, they're adorable. And if you have any dice in your classrooms, they're just as cute. So go scrambling through your board games that you're not playing anymore. Get those dice together. The kids roll the die. And at the bottom of the page, the back of the page, or another piece of paper entirely, you can sneak in some practice. Now, listen, if you stop one child, you better believe the child next to him, behind him, across the room, saw that interaction and they're thinking letter size because they know they could be next. During any subject, uh, use the magnetic recta square board. So this is a wipe off board. Um, and in truth, it's not magnetic. I have to always tell everybody it's ferrous backed. It means it has iron shifts so that magnets stick to it. But we have a lot of itinerants, teachers, therapists, maybe um, amongst you out there, you too, um, that go from class to class or school to school. So in order to make it lightweight, um, it's ferrous back comes in a tube so you can carry it. You can staple it to a, a, a bulletin board, thumbtack it. It works best if you back it up to a magnet board. It comes with little white thumbtacky magnets. And then uh, you use the pink, yellow, blue. It has 25 magnets um, to, you know, right on, to cover up a word. Right on the board, cover with the magnets, right on the magnets. They're all wipe off surfaces. It's a great way to introduce new concepts, vocabulary that's integral to a lesson. We got a unit here on, on weather.
for all grades. And I apologize. I realized that I did not put this slide into the handout. So uh, if you want to take a uh, screenshot, I'll wait a minute until I populate the whole uh, uh, screen, or you can just take notes here. But for all grades, issue adapted writing paper at different grade levels. So uh, in pre-K, the distance from the top to bottom line, the ruling, should be an inch and a half. Skip space refers to the space between a set of writing lines. That should be an inch. In kindergarten, uh, the distance from top to bottom line is an inch. The skip space should be five-eighths of an inch. First grade, three-quarters of an inch with a one-half inch skip space. Second grade, half an inch from top to bottom with a three-eighth inch skip space. Third grade adapted paper, First of all, it's the same ruling as regular ruled paper. What makes it adapted is that it has a, well, our paper has a thicker bottom line. Stopping is harder than starting. We give kids an extra chance to get it right. Uh, and it continues to have that dotted middle line. So that, uh, that really helps distinguish the sets of writing lines. And here's how beautifully this all works with size matters. So suppose um, Jason is in, um, Jason, you're in first grade. And you're doing an amazing job with those size one letters, those size two letters, size three letters. I'm doing my happy dance. Jason, I believe that you are ready for second grade paper. How do you feel? He feels fantastic. I don't know where he is. I'm he's dancing fed, over he's, here. He's dancing. Oh, he's dancing. <laughs> dancing is the right is the right response. Okay. Every, again, every little kid likes to feel like a big kid. I've graduated Jason up and sitting next to him is uh, Abdel. He says, well, how about me? And I say, you are so close, good buddy. Um, I'm going to be thinking about those size two letters. What, what, what's the rule now? Once again, we're singing and dancing. I'm going to come back in a couple of weeks. I, I believe that second grade papers in your future. This is a huge motivator. The kids want to graduate up. And a, a lovely thing that you can do for your teachers is to give them reams of two-sided uh, first, second, third grade papers so they have it available. During any subject, here's a great way to build that connection with your teacher. I'll imagine this. The kids walk in in the morning. They hang up their coat, their book bag, and their cubby. They grab a worksheet, and they have to solve the puzzle. So looking at these OW words down here, which one is the first one? I know you're saying to yourself, that's plow. And the second one? No. And the third one? Snowy. The fourth one? Grown. Show? How? Listen, it's a combination of the number of letters and letter size. The kids solve the puzzle, then they have to write the words. And for anybody who's been confronted by a teacher when you showed up at their classroom who has said to you, who are you taking? <laughs> you know, I don't want to take anybody. I want to come in. Okay, this is a way to win over those teachers. Create a worksheet because they're going to go, well, actually, that was pretty cool. You just supported curriculum. So they can write their letters. Eventually, this could be a job given to kids. They, they create these worksheets for their classmates. Uh, you can play games like Simon Says, be a letter line. So everybody knows how Simon Says works. So imagine this. Uh, you want to have go lines and finish lines. The kids are all facing the front of the room. Here's your board right here. Uh, maybe you make posters, get some foam core, make a big green stripe, put it on the left side. That's your go line. Uh, you have a checkerboard, put it on the right side. That's your finish line. Uh, if you don't have a setup like that, maybe you get some easels and you make your go lines and finish lines. You project, uh, you know, how you make each of, do each of the different letter lines. For instance, when, when Simon says, uh, be a standing tall line, you have to stand or sit if they're sitting uh, really straight like a statue. Simon says, be a lying down line. You're going to place your head on the desk or feeling really playful you can lie down across your desk on the floor on the on the windowsill simon says be a slant line now simon's going to either to ask you to be a forward or a backward slant if you're a forward slant you're going to lean toward the finish line if you're a backward slant you're going to lean toward the go line and remember you know how simon works he says simon says be a forward slant simon says be a backward slant simon says be a forward slant they, they look like cuckoo birds Okay, and then you finally say, um, be a forward slant. Okay, now everyone starts to move, but Simon didn't say they're out. 
Simon says, be a super C. Now, this is a little bit more challenging. You always have to face the finish line. That's the direction you're going. Put your hands up in the air and bend over so that your butt is pointing toward the go line. You like to pair that. You're going to want to pair that with Simon says, be a clock line. So you're going to continue facing the finish line, hands up in the air, and now you're going to bend backwards so your belly is toward the finish line. Simon says, be a super C. Be a, be a, Simon says, be a clock line. Be a, okay, the kids are going back and forth and they're all giggling and, and that's just a fun way to reinforce letter lines. Simon says, be a smile. Simon says, be a frown. Be a smile. Oh, you missed it. Okay, that's a fun game to play. Moving back to how else you can uh, bring these concepts into your classroom. Volunteer to be a center. Um, I was in a school that didn't believe in handwriting practice, handwriting instruction in kindergarten. And I'm like, really? I'll be a center. So I became a handwriting center. I was a very popular center. Everyone wanted, the truth is kids want to learn the rules. They, they, they want to please you. So that enabled me to model language strategies that the teachers could use and centers are a great time to play with the different concepts so i'll go over a few of these um center time i uh, games dissect and tally you want to find letters with each type of letter line uh maybe you want to find uh letters in different count up all the different letter lines in a student's name how many of each type of letter line uh, play directional games where you reinforce that positional movement. Movement toward the go line is backward. Movement toward the finish line is forward. Um, get sentence strips from your, their school issued ones. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that your school has them. And then open up your literacy, social studies, science books. And then using pink, yellow, blue markers, crayons, colored pencils, the kids are going to graph a phrase, a sentence, a word, and then trade it with their neighbor, make it something that's, that's meaningful, language that's meaningful, to solve the puzzle and then write the sentence. Again, both creation of the puzzle and then solving your neighbor's puzzle can be uh, a fun center game. Use the, the magnetic rectus square board. We call it the MRB because that's such a mouthful. Use the, the MRB to graph kids' names, high-frequency words, word wall words, play snowman. So what is snowman? It's going to look familiar. So you use the MRB and you cover up, you write the words and then you cover them up. And as the kids guess a letter uh, or they guess a wrong letter, you draw more and more parts of the snowman. If they get it right, you can write on the magnet or remove the magnet. If they get it wrong, well, you know where this is going. The idea is to solve the puzzle before the sun comes out because that will melt your snowmen. Uh, play ransom notes. Or right, This game requires a little bit of prep. You want to gather some samples of writing uh, from children and you're going to cut them into individual letters. So looking at the, you know, the old time ransom notes where they cut and paste in. Okay. That's what we're going for here. Okay. So looking at the word yarn, what would the score be? Now your denominator, there's always going to be a fraction. Your denominator is already always the number of letters. There's only one star. Here's your score. Looking at the word string as it's written, what would the score be? Well, how many of these letters are in stars? Now that N is not beautiful, but I'm scoring for size. I will play the dice game on N to try and make sure they trace that what's going to be a forward frown uh, better. But there's the score, three out of six. Uh, Wooly, oh, that came with the answer. <laughs> okay, two out of five. Okay, there's plenty of games where that came from, letter line equations. Oh, this is a um, free download from my website if you want to if you want to print out the letter line equation card. But imagine if you had a standing tall and three lying down lines, what letter would you be making? Oh, you guys are so smart and you didn't even have to say it out loud. <laughs> the uppercase A. 
uh, letter blocks. Now, some of these centers we actually do during my uh, live courses. So we, we create this material, but um, you can make this uh, in, your, in your schools as is. Get those sentence strips. Your school issued ones are often an inch and a half from top to bottom line. The ones that you get from staples are like an inch from top to bottom line. So, so whatever your, your sentence strip is, you're going to use that measurement to make your size one, two or three blocks. Um, you can take a sheet of construction paper if you want, or even better, um, get those foam sheets because they're more durable. They're not going to rip so quickly. And then you're going to make top and bottom lines uh, thusly. So if you have a pre-K student, make the distance from the top to the bottom line four inches. The distance from the dotted line to the bottom line, two inches. Kindergarten, top to bottom line will be two inches. Dotted line to bottom line. This, this, this is, um, yeah, this is if you're going to be making those, um, the pink, yellow, and blue squares and rectangles. If it's an inch, the distance can be an inch and a half top to bottom or three quarters of an inch. If you're in second grade, you can make smaller ones, an inch from top to bottom. And then get your pink, yellow, and blue construction paper, or better still, if you can get foam sheets. And these are the dimensions that you're going to be making. Your uh, pink are going to be, uh, your pink rectangles are going to be four inches by two inches. So you're going to, you know, make lines. The kids can help make this. Use your, uh, the alpha triangle. I don't even know if I show that, show that to you. This is the alpha triangle. I'm holding it up. So look, look at me. <laughs> okay. This will help you to measure it. And when the kids are drawing lines, they can put their hand above it and not get their fingers in their way, help cut them out. Oh, alpha triangle there. Uh, that can help you to measure it. And then you can store these, create a little envelope if you want, or just use an envelope to store all your shapes in it. Um, and then when, before any kind of uh, writing activity, if there's language, vocabulary, the kids would pull out their, uh, let me just go back and show this. They'd pull out their white foam sheet. They'd pull out their pink, yellow, and blue, their envelope with their pink, yellow, and blue squares and rectangles, and they would graph it on the foam sheet or the sentence strip. And if your principal is on board with this, perhaps you could encourage them to identify a wall outside of their office as the wall of fame. Once kids have mastered letter size, they get to write their name on a sentence strip, hang it up on the wall. It's a real status symbol. You know, everybody likes to have their name on, you know, up in lights. That's kind of what you're doing. You're giving them the opportunity to also have their name in lights. Uh, let's talk about copying. Okay, so that was some ways to build um, uh, the buy-in. Let's talk about build, how, how to promote copying because it's another issue uh, that we often get referrals for. Kids are missing their bus because they weren't done copying the homework or they copied something down, but there were so many errors you couldn't read it. They couldn't even read it. They, know, they didn't know what, they, what the assignment was. So know when, when you're teaching copying, this is the SMHP approach to copying. There's a visual auditory and oral component to it. And here's the, the strategy. So first, the, the visual part, direct line copy. That means that the prompt, whatever is they're copying, is on the paper right above the lines they're going to be writing on. So everything's within the same visual field. They basically don't have to move their eyes. That's followed by a near point uh, prompt, which is at the end of the desk. And I'm amazed how many times I'd go into a classroom and the kids kindergarten first, they're, they're expected to copy something that's to the far end of the desk and you're asking for a gaze shift or the prompt is off to the side. And now you're doing a lateral gaze shift where the, uh, the medial lateral muscles of the eyes are expected to, uh, the excursion is different lengths. Okay. Start with direct line near point at midline. It's now at the center of the back of the desk or a little bit further away, uh, even further. And then now it's at the board. So that's the sequence of copying distance that goes into this rubric. Distractions refers to what else is on the prompt. If you wrote on, um, uh, if the child is just copying a single sentence from a prompt, there might be, not be anything else on the paper. 
but maybe they're copying out of a book and now there's a graphic or some other things that they have to copy. Now they got to pretend they don't see it there. Maybe there's a lot of that kind of distractions. Maybe there's something that's written there, but it's in a whole different context. It's, it's not related to what they're writing or, or maybe they are copying a sentence out of a paragraph, in which case the, the, the um, prompt is embedded. In terms of visual cues, is the prompt on the same kind of paper that kids are going to be writing? They're writing on first grade adapted paper. The prompt is on first grade adapted paper. Maybe they also have a near point a sample of what letters look like. Maybe they have an alpha triangle nearby, or you have a desktop alphabet strip that they've been referencing and they haven't destroyed at this point in the year. I said the same type of paper, but, um, uh, there's, you know, um, it's, a, it's the same type of paper. Maybe the prompt is on um, third grade paper and they're writing on first grade paper or vice versa. And there's a near point Q. Maybe it's the same type of paper, but there's no near point Q. No point, no reference. Maybe the teacher just wrote on the board and there's no lines at all, but you're giving them a, an alpha triangle. Uh, maybe they're writing on the board and they have nothing to reference. So maybe there's that. And then the other thing to reference when it comes to understanding copying is chunking. So chunking uh, is language that teachers use when they are promoting fluency in reading. After they teach kids how to identify individual sounds at a time, they teach them to blend those sounds, consonant blends or consonant vowel consonant. Now we got phonemes. So that helps them to be faster and more accurate and know that this is part of the written language production standards. If you don't know about that, you don't know about it yet because it's brilliant and, and not in this short course right here, but you can download it from my website and learn about it. Um, so chunking, it's divided into the number of letters that you copy at a time before you have to look back up to the prompt or the number of words you have to copy before you look up to the prompt again. Now, if the word is chunking, for instance, I see a C, I write a C, I see an H, I write a, an H, I see a U. That's not very fast. I'm copying one letter at a time. But if I can uh, see groups of letters, C-H-U, and then I write C-H-U, and then I look back up and I go N-K-I, I'm doing three letters at a time. So no, the strategy to help kids, the, the auditory and the oral strategy is to say it when you read it, say it when you write it. You, kids need to hear it. If they, if you can't hear them, they can't hear themselves. So you want to make sure they are subvocalizing using that one inch voice. And now you watch their gaze shift. They look up, they say it when they read it, they look back down, they say it when they write it. Note how much they wrote before they look back up again. You're going to reach in with your red pen and you're going to scoop it. So this child wrote the words, if the, and then he looked back up. He wrote the words, W, the, the letters W O R. Then he looked back up D S. Then he looked back up. So if words are familiar, it may be possible to copy two, three, four words at a time. If a word is especially long or it's new, and they may be just be copying two, three, four letters at a time. And then you go back and you tally how many individual letters that they cut, copy a time. One, two, three, four. You're going to put it onto the rubric. So going back to the rubric, uh, this prompt was on the board. So it was far point. There was nothing else on the board, no distractions. It was an online prompt. They, um, the teacher wrote on the board and uh there were no lines there and the child didn't have an alpha triangle handy and then i'm going to put all those tally marks underneath chunking uh so that i know so now you have data now you have data uh to use when you are scoring somebody's copying skills uh in terms of pushing in the student workbook is really helpful if uh, your school adopts uh, a handwriting curriculum they adopt size matters in the beginning, lots of practice on um, making different types of letter lines, starting on green, stopping on red. Those are your standing tall lines, your slant lines. Sometimes note that the green is at the bottom because you have you can have some slant lines that go from bottom to top. Uh, your super C lines, uh, smiles and frowns go forward and backward. Clock lines can be counterclockwise. 
um, teach the kids about super C uh, and uh, starting points and initial lines, touch points, um, and then the rules for letter size, one, two, and three, and then um, stars and dice. And then you get up to an actual practice page, looks like this in the student workbook, uh, identifying the letter size. What size is uppercase F? Well, I don't make it hard. The entire alphabet is in pink. There's a pink box here, it says size one. You're gonna do the song and the dance. Identify the different types of letter lines. How many standing tall, lying down or slant lines? And sometimes the answer is none. How many touch points are in there? Look at the purple letter count. Touching, 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 six. Mark the starting point on the big purple letter. Trace the initial line. Which letter is star worthy and why are the other ones not? This is everyone's favorite section on the page because they all look like Fs. Only one of them is star worthy. The kids have to tell you why the other ones aren't. Do a little trace it, make it inside the long letter box. The kids play their own individual dice game. They roll to four, they make four, they stop and score themselves. Now they can swap books with their neighbor if, as long as they're kind. Then they roll the dice until they finish up the lines. Note the go lines and finish lines are here. There's a little coloring section. Note that the coloring sections are two frame stories. Uh, starts on the uppercase page. This is a frog catching fish. Ends on the lowercase page. It's fish chasing after a frog. Um, and they're intentionally detailed. Even though I tell you that the, the student workbook is a kindergarten level book, we don't write that anywhere on the book because we do have older kids that are working at this letter level the first year that schools districts adopt size matters we encourage workbooks for kindergarten also but the just the same the cartoons are detailed because i'm promoting this and if you're looking at my my um camera i am promoting that mobility at my ips that push pull movement not this so you just want them to call it just color in his foot just color in the fish and model that movement and if the kids need more practice there's a series of activity books, 18 activity books that practice each letter inside of letter boxes. So um, that said, now are there any questions? There absolutely are. Dr. Bev, I'm gonna go ahead and share the two of us. And first I wanna say thank you so much. You went through a lot in an hour, and I'm sure everyone is very appreciative of that. If you haven't already, please give Dr. Bev a like on this YouTube channel. Really appreciate you all staying here for this entire event. And yeah, I did share the link to your free resources over in the chat, your website with the free resources. So everyone can go over there, just kind of click the ones you want, put in your email, and Dr. Bev will send you all the free resources that they have. Um, really quickly before we get into the questions, certificate, just a reminder to earn a certificate or to receive your certificate of completion for this event, uh, you will have to be a member of the OT Schoolhouse Collaborative. And you can learn more about that over at otschoolhouse.com slash collab. You get access to the replay of this course. You'll get access to replays of other courses, plus our future live courses. We've got Sue Basic coming up next month. We've got Jamie Chavez talking all about sensory during the summer. Three entire sessions all about sensory. So we're going to go a deep dive on that this summer. So questions, we had quite a few. I'm gonna grab, go right into them. Um, the first one is how do kids with cognitive deficits respond to this program? We had a lot of questions about working with older students or working with students with cognitive deficits. So um, just wanna get your take on that. So, um, well, they work well to this. Now, they might not be using the student workbook if it is too busy and know that, listen, you guys are OTs. You can create windows, like little, little um, uh, use a cardstock to, to cut away just one lesson per page. You don't have to show all 10 learning activities on a student workbook page at one time. You can create a series of little uh, cardstock that, that just exposes one of the lessons if it's visually overwhelming. For our kids who are more cognitively impaired, you may want to use the... Um, the adapted writing paper and the master guide is fully reproducible. I didn't show you a, a graphic of that, but um, the master guide, it's called the adapted writing paper master guide. There's over a hundred uh, pages in there and you have permission to copy every single one of them. Now we make the book extra long so the spiral doesn't show in the copier. 
because that would bother me. So <laughs> I want you a beautiful paper. So you might want to choose the preschool or kindergarten level paper to work with those students. So they are working on individual letter boxes. Letter boxes can help them frame their, their letters. Um, but we are having great success with our kids with cognitive. And, and let's be honest, if they have a significant cognitive impairment, do they need the entire alphabet? Probably not. You're gonna work on those letters that are meaningful. Maybe they're gonna be able to make their, their first and last name. Maybe they can write a few more things than that. And maybe it's just their first name or maybe it's just their initials, or maybe it's adapted letter formations. And, and we go over that in the therapist manual that you can use adapted letter formations uh, to teach kids. Continuous stroke letters might be more helpful for kids with cognitive impairment. Uh, and I wanna build on that to talk about kids on the spectrum. I don't know if that question came up. It did, it did. Oh, oh, great, because the feedback has been terrific. So as you may well know, it's a very rule driven group. They, they, they like rules. So the rules speak to them. That really helps them because they, they're rule followers. Uh, we've had great feedback from therapists across the country about that. I also hear that, um, the, the kids on the spectrum, uh, like the feel of the MRB, um, the, the magnets have rounded edges. They slide around the board. They like working with that. So we had one study so far, it was a small study. So we're calling it a pilot study. Also, you know, ready for expansion and putting that out there for anybody contemplating um, a, a research study, one wants to get involved in research. Um, but the preliminary result was that the kids on the spectrum that participated in this program showed significant improvement. So, um, so, so there's that study. It made it to a poster session. You are welcome to, I think this poster is on the website. You can view the poster, um, but we're hoping to have a larger study come out of that. Awesome. All right. We had another question from Catherine, and that is how do you get kids to stop wanting to draw the spaghetti and meatballs once they kind of got that down and just start eyeballing it? <laughs> oh, how do you get them to stop drawing it and just to stop? It? Well, in the beginning, you really do want them. Listen, I, I don't know if this came across at all. I actually started my whole OT journey as an art major. Uh, so I identify as an artist as much as I do a, an OT. And then my mother just thought I could make a living in art. So OT. But I love being an OT. Um, that said, space is a very difficult thing for kids to, to grasp. Because by definition, you're talking about nothing. Okay, so in the beginning, when you're trying to reinforce consistency of spacing, it is helpful to draw those spaghetti and meatballs in it. Uh, let the kids see what you mean by too much spacing. I can fit two spaghetti here. You've made it concrete. Space by itself is very abstract. So, uh, so do that in the beginning. I don't think I've never heard of anybody. Um, having a difficult time weaning kids uh, away from making their spaghetti and meatballs. They they love they love getting those scores. They feel so so happy to see their page looking like you know it's filled filled with stars. Um, I, I I don't I haven't heard that being an issue. All righty. Well, we'll continue on. Thank you. Um, what is the difference within the program between size and placement of a letter? Okay, so placement or what some uh, uh, assessments called alignment, they're talking about just sitting on the bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about size that has to fill the whole space. It has to touch the top line, touch the bottom line, can't go higher, can't go lower. Okay, so... So when we talk about size, it is is filling up, um, if it's a size one, top and bottom, size two, dotted line and bottom line, size three, um, dotted line and going below the line. So I think it goes beyond placement. Yeah, and would you have a, a different word within the program for placement or would it just be, it, it's gotta be on the size and that's where it fits within that size? Right. When we talk about size, it's got to be touching the bottom line and it can't go lower. So if you're yeah. touching the bottom line, but you're dipping below, mm, that's not going to earn you a star. 
Now, listen, it's not like I'm not interested in anything else. Um, when you do an assessment, uh, we make a note if there's issues of shape, of spa of, um, of directionality, uh, are there reversals? Those are implications for treatment. I'm going to address them in treatment. And there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do uh, with all of that. Um, but I'm only measuring size. I'm telling you. And eventually I'm measuring space too. But in the beginning, I'm only measuring size. There's so much that I can do when I know scores on size. And honest to goodness, everybody, I hope that you'll take a moment to go to our website, look at the before and after pictures. Yeah, it's under... Um, resources, kids results. Um, you can look at before and after pictures and there's timelines. We have changes from the beginning of a lesson to the end of the same lesson. It's crazy. Um, awesome. Week one, week three, and you can print out a whole booklet if you want to share this with colleagues. Um, you know, honestly, it, it blows our mind too, but yeah, this is, it, it happens really quickly. All right, Bev, I've got two more two more questions with you i think this first one will be a pretty quick answer from alicia she wants to know what population up to ninth grade was the research study on changing handwriting are most of your research is it done on typical developing or whatever we want to identify as typical developing or what's the research with what population okay great question it first of all, it was the largest study ever done on handwriting um it had we had kindergarten first and second grade we had a control and intervention classroom in each grade. We had two different school districts, an urban one and a rural one. And we used three different um, standardized or, on, or criterion referenced assessments. This was a massive study. So the, the first research study covered three grades. Um, uh, Anne Lee did a study in second grade um, where she measured kid, the buy-in with kids using the dice game, being able to score themselves. Um, somebody else did a, a, an assessment with kids in fifth grade. I can't remember what that assessment was. Um, so we're mainly elementary, uh, but I think we had one in fifth grade. Uh, yes, we're looking for all grades, all mm -hmm. grades. That's such a good question. I'm going to go to my own website and look up and see what they are. I don't know. <laughs> I know there's so many research. I've highlighted a few of them on the podcast, especially when you came on. I think that was episode 89. We talked a little bit about the research. Um, I, I know you have several. And yeah, I, I think you have a lot of that research up on the website. So people can really go on and, and dive into it. There. Yes. yes, please. Yeah. You can download it. You can uh, read it on your own. If you if you take my course, I, I, I tell you about it. Make, you know, it makes it faster for you. But you're certainly welcome to download it, share it with your colleagues. Yeah. And if there's any articles that you might want to hear about on the OT Schoolhouse podcast, please shoot me an email. Let us know. That makes my job easy. I don't even have to worry about what the next episode is about. You just tell me what, what you want to learn about. And our final question uh, that we're going to take this evening is from Allison. And it says, our district is going to single lined paper as part of their curriculum next year. Any tips for that? I feel like a lot of kids might have difficulty with learning size when there's only one line. So yeah, my, my suggestion is don't. <laughs> Why do you do that? that? So kids need structure. And that's one of the first things whenever I see on Facebook, you know, what do I do with this child's writing? My One of my first things is uh, uh, to say to them is give them some good adapted writing paper with a top line, a dotted middle line, teach them the rules for letter size. Kids need structure. I think that it, when you say a single line, you're talking about regular ruled paper. Um, she talked about afterwards about putting three line paper as an accommodation on the IEP for some of the students. Uh, she's oh, talking about yeah. maybe using a tier one opportunity. I'm not sure she might chime in in just a moment and I'll let you know, but um, yeah. Yeah, you, um, yeah, that, that's misguided. I'm so sorry to say that you really need, especially for your younger students, uh, they need the three lined paper. Um, you know, when I would see, t uh, listen, I was called into classrooms where their letters were all over the place. And I would have, first I'd create a box just to help those letters find a, a home. And then I would give them lines so they would kind of sit their letters on the line. Now these are my youngest kids. Kids need structure. Um, 
it, it would it make me so sad to see the kids go from kindergarten, that primary green, thin newsprint paper, but, but it had three lines, to first grade, and now they're on regular old paper, and now I'm getting a zillion referrals. Well, yeah. they need the three lines. <laughs> there are lots of adapted papers out there. Be a discriminating consumer. Um, get good paper. It, and, and, and good paper is not a single line. Sorry about that. Yeah, she said, no, it's not necessarily even wide ruled. It's just an open line, which which makes me think of some of those really weird handouts that we often see in the classroom. That's just, you know, lines that are spread apart that are obviously way too big for a single letter. So sometimes, and we have um, lined labels that you can, they come in first, second, and third grade. You can peel it off, put it into those workbooks where it has mm -hmm. a big open space. If there's a single line, you could sit there and make a top line, a dotted middle line. Who has time for that? You can yeah. cut up our lined labels to put first, second, third grade paper in there. Or I'm going to be honest with you, I love Leggy Liner. Polly yep. and I are friends. She's a colleague. She's an OT. This is a brilliant invention. Um, uh, look into Leggy Liners. The kids need the structure. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just putting into the chat uh, Leggy Liner and also Woo Tape. Woo Tape is similar concept, except it's actually like a it's tape, as it says in the name, Woo Tape, rather than the roll on like the Leggy Liner. But both ideas are wonderful. I would yeah, have both on hand because it has a series of first, second, or third grade ruling. But yeah, give the kids the structure. That alone is going to like help those kids to to make their letters the right size so they stop rolling over into OT referrals. <laughs> You've yeah. got lots to do. We can get hand running under control. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that is going to wrap us up. But I want to wrap us up with this kind comment from Camry, who says, love listening to Bev talk and her energy and enthusiasm. Great program, too. Thank you, Bev. Do you have any oh, last words for everyone, you. Bev? I do. And thank you so much for that. This is this is fun for me. I am going to be doing a two day course coming up in August. If that interests anybody, you can download the flyer. It's August 6th and 7th on Pacific time. Day one is an intro course. It's a six hour course. We send you the handbook. We send you all the lab materials. Day two is a tier one certification course. Again, you're going to get the handbook. You get some complimentary over $200 of free SMHP stuff. Uh, you get a, um, a wand so your kids can be star worthy and other star worthy goodies. So if that interests you, uh, look into that. Um, this is our website. This is my email. Honestly, you honor me uh, with the opportunity to brainstorm with you. If you have any questions, uh, I would I would love to talk with you more. Jason, thank you so much for inviting me today. Yes, thank you. We really appreciate having you on, Bev. I love collaborating with you. I love your energy. I remember learning from you, gosh, probably like eight to 10 years ago. Um, I've been oh, hooked ever kidding. since. <laughs> 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 so thank you so much and definitely look forward to uh, working with you more in the future. Take care, Beverly, and take care to everyone. Thank you so much for being here, whether live or on the replay.